Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. I'm also an independent director at Johnson & Johnson and the director of the uh, National Academy of Medicine's Consortium on uh, Value and Science-Driven Healthcare. And I'm pleased to welcome all of you to this afternoon's uh, webinar on developing study endpoints in real world settings. We know that these are very busy and, and extraordinary times. Uh, we appreciate your taking the time out to be with us today. And uh, we're learning again and again, just how important developing evidence, including on meaningful endpoints in real world settings are. So uh, we think this is a timely meeting as well. And we appreciate all of you joining us. Um, I'd like to start with developing or defining some key terms, just a, a little bit of a level set on how we're approaching these issues uh, that we'll be talking about throughout the discussion today. Uh, real world data or data related to a patient's health status or the delivery of health care, uh, data that are routinely collected from a variety of sources. And then real world evidence is the evidence derived from that data that provides information regarding the use and potential benefits and risks of a medical product. And this uh, evidence from the real world complements what has been a, a separate territory, but I think they're going to increasingly um, uh, get more integrated that uh, complements evidence from randomized clinical trials. These studies have the potential to be more representative of the intended population, including people who might be difficult to include, at least at scale in, in randomized clinical trials. They may better reflect the evolving standard of care since so many treatments reaching the market uh, these days uh, uh, involve important interactions with other technologies and in some cases can get better over time. And these uh, real world evidence studies can also help us capture outcomes that are most relevant to patients, uh, like some of the endpoints we'll be talking about today. There's been growing interest in how real world data and real world evidence can be used for regulatory decision making. And while the ultimate regulatory acceptability of real world evidence is still being worked out, uh, we're seeing a lot of promise in the utility of these data, a growing number of applications of real world data and real world evidence for uh, import answering important um, regulatory questions. And that's increased as well during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic when the traditional ways of data collection, even in clinical trials, uh, have had to be replaced by new methods for patients who can't easily come into facilities and where we may need to rely on new kinds of electronic data. So we're uh, learning both in the pandemic context and of uh, this uh, overall trend towards more use of uh, richer electronic data how to turn it into uh, evidence that can actually be helpful for regulatory purposes. And that includes the development and validation of clinical study endpoints that can demonstrate medical product effectiveness in the real world setting. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, because there are differences in data collection, patient populations and care patterns in the real world, clinical trial endpoints are not always translatable to this setting for evidence development. And instead, researchers often need to choose endpoint components that uh, wouldn't be the standard traditional approach in a clinical trial for the same disease or condition. There's been a lot of work done to create frameworks and best practices for developing clinical trial endpoints, uh, but so far at least there have been limited resources addressing the unique considerations for developing real world endpoints. And that brings us to today's focus. Uh, we're going to uh, spend some time on our most recent Duke Margolis white paper on developing real world endpoints. The white paper is intended to be a resource for researchers and for measurement tool experts who are developing effectiveness endpoints for studies taking place in real world settings and decision makers for assessing the regulatory acceptability of these real world endpoints. This is an area that continues to develop. And so we're looking forward to talking with you today about these concepts and how to build on them from here. 
Uh, before we begin, I'd like to recognize the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy's Real World Evidence Collaborative. This is a multi-stakeholder collaboration, as you can see from this slide, that uh, is focused on advancing the use of real world data and evidence to support regulatory decision making. The consortium is made possible through the generosity of the Margolis Family Foundation, which provides core resources for our center to address health policy priorities, as well as a combination of financial and in-kind support from the collaborative members, including AbbVie, Amgen, Eli Lilly, Pfizer, Genentech, uh, uh, part of Roach, GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Novartis, Teva, and UCB. Uh, and last, a special thanks to the Real World Endpoints Evidence, I'm sorry, the Real World Endpoints Working Group for their contributions to this white paper. Um, we could really roll credits at this point. We had a lot of involvement from a diverse set of perspectives, and we really appreciate the working group's efforts sharing their expertise and the subject matter, providing some feedback throughout the process of developing this report. And so before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. This webcast is being re recorded and it will be available on the Duke Margolis website after the event. Uh, during the event, all participants will be muted for the duration. Uh, to access the agenda, you can visit our website, uh, Duke Margolis online, and the speaker bios are there as well, as well as other Duke Margolis news and publications. So uh, with those opening comments, I'd like to turn this over now to Kara Marcon from the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy to provide an overview of the roadmap for developing real world endpoints. Kara. Thank you, Mark. Hi, my name is Kara Marcon and I'm a senior research assistant with the real world evidence team at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. Today, I will be providing a brief overview of our white paper, A Roadmap for Developing Study Endpoints in Real-World Settings. While there has been much interest in the use of real-world evidence to support regulatory decision-making, uncertainty remains. An integral to addressing this uncertainty and improving the regulatory acceptability of real-world endpoints is developing endpoints that are robust in the real-world setting. As such, this white paper has several objectives. The first is to standardize key terms for a multidisciplinary audience, given that many different stakeholders are often involved in the real world endpoint development process. Secondly, this paper provides a roadmap for developing an endpoint in the real world setting. This paper teases out how key differences between the clinical trial and real world setting influence a researcher's considerations for developing and validating study endpoints. Lastly, this paper examines opportunities to enhance the use of real-world endpoints for regulatory decision-making. So what is an endpoint? An endpoint is a precisely defined variable that's intended to reflect an outcome of interest, pardon me, that is statistically analyzed to address a particular research question. And with this definition in mind, we'll now walk through a roadmap for developing an effectiveness endpoint in the real-world setting. I'll start by walking through each of these components in detail. Then we will look at an example that shows how all of these components can come together to form a real world endpoint. The first component is the concept of interest. The concept of interest or COI is the aspect of an individual's clinical, biological, physical, or functional state or experience that the outcome assessment is intended to capture or reflect. When studying a particular disease or condition, there are many different concepts of interest that could be chosen. The selection of the concept of interest is uh, heavily tied to the research question. Oftentimes, a concept of interest uh, for a study on a particular disease or condition is going to be the same in a clinical trial versus a real world setting. One reason that a concept of interest may be different in a real world setting is if there is something that is more clinically relevant to measure in the real world setting. After the concept of interest, is defined, an outcome can be selected. The outcome is a measurable characteristic that's influenced or affected by the intervention or exposure. Similarly to the concept of interest, the outcome is often the same in a clinical trial setting versus a real world setting. But one example of where the outcome may change is if the treatment benefit is captured in a different manner in the real world setting as compared to a clinical trial setting. So one example of this could be in monitoring uh, cancer progression, 
In a clinical trial, we may use RESIST to monitor tumor growth, whereas in the real world setting, we could use something such as tumor markers uh, in order to monitor cancer progression. And for this paper, we specifically focused on clinical and humanistic outcomes. After the concept of interest and outcome are identified, then endpoint development can begin. There are four different types of, uh, the four different components of an endpoint. So the first is the type of the assessment made, the assessment tool used, the timing of the assessment, and other relevant details. And the endpoint development process is often iterative, so these components may not be chosen specifically in this order. And endpoint development is, he is heavily dependent on the research question, as the endpoint must reflect the concept of interest. So now I'll walk through each component of the endpoint in more detail and provide some considerations for choosing these components specifically in the real world setting. So the first component is the type of assessment made. And this refers to the outcome assessment. There are three types of outcome assessments, survival, biomarkers, and clinical outcome assessments. So survival often uh, refers to the duration of survival, and it's not discussed thoroughly throughout this paper. The second type of outcome assessment is a biomarker. And biomarkers reflect biologic or pathogenic processes or um, exposure to uh, an intervention. And biomarkers are often indirect patient assessments. Clinical outcome assessments measure how patient feels or functions. And there are four types of clinical outcome assessments, patient-reported outcomes, or PROs, clinician-reported outcomes, ClinRows, observer-reported outcomes, OBSROs, and performance outcomes, or PERFOs. And oftentimes, the type of assessment made is going to be the same in the clinical trial versus the real-world setting, similarly to the outcome and concept of interest. But the type of assessment made could change if there is a better way of measuring clinical benefit in the real world setting. It could also change based on the availability of the assessment tool. Uh, the second component is the assessment tool used. And the assessment tool is, uh, is used to measure the outcome assessment. Uh, so traditionally in a clinical trial, if uh, you're using a clinical outcome assessment, the assessment tool could be something like a paper or a phone questionnaire. If the outcome assessment was a biomarker, then the tool could be a laboratory test. And there are many different real world considerations for the assessment tool. And I won't go into them in too much detail as our panelists are going to discuss them in session two, but I will start by providing a, a brief overview of some of the major real world considerations. So the first is that it may not be practical, cost effective or relevant to use the clinical trial tool in the real world setting. It's important that the, that the real world tool be relevant to patient care. And there are two types of real world tools that our panelists will be discussing. Uh, the first is secondary use data algorithms, which rely on data from sources such as electronic health records or claims among other data sources. The second type of real world tool is a digital measurement tool. Uh, and this refers to a variety of tools some which may be electronic versions of traditional tools that we've seen used in clinical trials before, or some may measure an outcome in an entirely new way. The third component of an endpoint is the timing of the assessment. The assessment timing should be clinically relevant and incorporate a baseline measurement. The assessment timing should reflect when changes due to disease or treatment are expected to occur. So the assessment should not be administered more frequently than we anticipate disease progression or change. And there are many real world considerations for related to the timing of the assessment. Uh, two of the important ones are the feasibility of the frequency of assessment and administrator and patient burden. So assessments that are administered too frequently may cause a burden to the administrator and the patient, and that could lead to lower quality care. Uh, but if the assessment is not administered frequently enough, that may lead to data that is unavailable at the time point of interest. So it's important to balance these factors when choosing the timing of the assessment. Because patients in the real world setting are not following a strict assessment frequency as they may be in a clinical trial, it's important for researchers to acknowledge and consider that um, there may be variation of timing between and within patients. Lastly, it's important to limit impact to generalizability. So the assessment should not be administered 
um, so frequently that it's not comparable to the care that a patient would receive as part of their routine clinical care. The last aspect of an endpoint is the other relevant details. And this uh, component is largely dependent on the research question. But one aspect uh, of the other relevant details is the causal contrast measure or statistic, such as time to deterioration or time to event. And this um, causal contrast measure uh, is how we determine whether or not there was change reflected in the endpoint. So some real world considerations that are always important when developing a real world endpoint are first pre-specifying study design approach and statistical analysis plan ahead of time. Secondly, when, what, as always when working with real world data, it's vital to address data and methodological challenges such as intercurrent events or data gaps among others. So now that we've walked through all of the components of an endpoint, We'll examine this example so that we can see how all of the different components come together in order to form a real world endpoint. So the first component, the concept of interest, is the aspect of a patient's health that we're interested in. So for this example, we chose the physical function. And secondly, the outcome. So this is the measurable characteristic. And here we're looking at exercise capacity. So with a concept of interest, the physical function, and an outcome of exercise capacity, then we can start to choose the components of our endpoint. So for here, for the type of assessment made, our outcome assessment, we chose a performance outcome or a PERFO, which you'll remember is a type of clinical outcome assessment. For the assessment tool used, we use a digitized six minute walk test. A six minute walk test is reflected by how far a patient can walk, usually on a hard flat surface within a six minute time frame. The timing of the assessment is weekly from baseline to 12 weeks, which is the end of the study. And here uh, for our other relevant details, we're looking at the mean change in distance in meters walked and uh, as our causal contrast measure. So now we can bring all of these components together and arrive at the following real world endpoint, which is the mean change in exercise capacity in distance in meters walked in the six minute walk test from baseline to 12 weeks. After choosing and developing the real world endpoint, it's essential to evaluate the endpoint. So part of this evaluation is validation. And validation is a process to establish that the performance of the test or tool or instrument is acceptable for its intended purpose. So this may include first uh, validation that the outcome and concept of interest are reflective of the research question, but it also will include validating that the tool is acceptable for the context in which you plan to use it. I won't go too far into validation as some of our panelists plan to touch on it in our next session, uh, session two. And then the other aspect of evaluating the endpoint is assessing its regulatory acceptability. So as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the regulatory acceptability of real world uh, evidence. So our panelists in session three will be talking about how we can improve the regulatory acceptability of real world endpoints, and also looking for opportunities for us to come together as a stakeholder community to advance the use of real world evidence for regulatory decision making. And with that, I will turn it back to Mark to introduce our next panel. Thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Kara, thank you very much. And as, as Kara mentioned in that uh, very concise overview, a key set of issues related to real world endpoints goes to their validation and selecting and validating the assessment tool is the main focus for this next session. Um, and uh, as you just heard, uh, the assessment tool is one of the components of an endpoint. Um, uh, of uh, endpoint uh, development. Our panelists are gonna talk about considerations for selecting and validating assessment tools, including clinical outcome assessments, digital measurement tools, and secondary use data algorithms. So a, a broad part of the approaches that Kara described in her overview. Um, very pleased to have four expert panelists with us today to do this. Linda Nelson from GlaxoSmithKline, Bryce Reeve from Duke University, Vincent Willey from Health Corps, Jennifer Goldstack, Goldsack from Digital Medicine Society. Uh, additional details about their bios are in the background materials for the meeting. 
Um, but in the interest of time, I'd like to uh, go straight to our first uh, panelist, Linda Nelson, who's Senior Director and Head of Oncology Patient-Centered Outcomes for GSK. Uh, Linda? Hello. Hello, and you're on. <laughs> I'm good. I'm here. I, because of my background and where I'm living, which is living in industry drug trials, I'm going to focus on patient-centered concepts related to how patients feel or function, which is really the goal of both drug treatment trials as well as healthcare. And I think one of the ways I want to propose we think about having validated endpoints available to, you, to us is thinking about core outcome sets which may represent um, you know, a valuable shortcut to support availability of well-defined patient-centered endpoints with potential for use in real-world settings. So as I said, I'm coming from a pharma perspective and I'm coming from a perspective um, of developing um, strategies to have well-defined and nuanced insights into how patients feel or function after treatment. Um, so our emphasis is on including patient-centered endpoints into clinical trials to understand how patients feel and function. As we move to real-world data, we really want us to know the same insights. Have we improved how patients feel and function with either new drugs or other interventions, but in wider, more representative populations in clinical care centers? Um, until recently, patient-centric endpoints were not very available in many real world data sources when we focused much more on billing claims, but with increasing use of electronic health records that may link to patient generated health data, we're gonna have access to endpoints and measures that are more focused on patient centered outcomes to treatment, including patient reported outcome measures, as well as actively and passively collected data from digital health technology tools. And as Kara described, if we're thinking of the endpoint as the totality that includes the concept of interest, the measure or the means of collecting data, and the endpoint or the form of the health statement, then the context of use is different in real world because we have much less control over the frequency and the motivation to collect the information. But we still want to think about the same concepts in outcomes for patients. So in a randomized clinical trial, we have rigorous timing definitions and implementation of data collection, which helps support interpretation of results. In real world, the data is gonna be often collected at varying time intervals and based on a variety of different patient and health system motivations. And these differences will substantially impact the interpretation of the data. I think there are two approaches we can keep. First is that the real world um, data development endpoints that CARA presented, it was very consistent with the approach defined by the FDA in the 2009 patient reported outcome guidance. Both of them provide a path to define the measures and build the evidence to support the measures as fit for purpose. Both of them start with a focus on starting with the concepts that matter to the patients which are relevant both in trials and in clinical practice um, and help us, then they help us both to identify or develop the appropriate tool and define the relevant endpoint to derive the data. So what we need to do is find ways of developing and implementing feasible measurement tools of these key concepts. And I think core outcome sets are one way we can approach which will provide a bit of a shortcut. So there are lots of groups to developing core outcome sets. Now there's ICHOM, OMERACT has been around forever. Comet um, is, has a database and developing good methodology, but in general, core outcome sets are gonna be developed with a consensus from patients, healthcare providers, um, payers, regulators, and methodologists of what's important to measure with patients. So I put a plea in that for many patient-centered concepts, this is a good place to start. Um, the key for us then is going to take these key concepts and understand how the difference in terms of timing and motivations change the interpretation. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you. Um, Linda, th thanks very much for those uh, opening comments. So next is uh, Bryce Reeve, who's Professor of Population Health Sciences and Professor of Pediatrics at uh, Duke School of Medicine. Thank you very much, Mark, um, and thank you to uh, Kara and Linda for their wonderful comments. And so while they have uh, talked about the importance of making sure in a real world setting that we 
we are measuring what we call patient-centered outcomes that we're measuring what matters to patients, my brief comments and points will focus more on, on selecting and validating the tools that will be used to measure those important patient-centered outcomes. And so there, I have a few key points I'd like to make. Now, the first thing point I wanna make sure is everyone talks about making sure you're using a valid tool. Um, and we should have a valid tool for clinical trials and of course clinical in the real world setting for clinical practice use as well. And one thing as I wanna make sure is clear is, you know, the, a, a tool is not valid and not valid. It's not a dichotomy. Um, so there's sort of a sort of continuum of validity if you think about it. And what our measurement field is trying to do is build a body of evidence to support the validity or support the reliability of a particular measure. And so over time, um, as a tool starts to be used, you're gain, again, you're gaining more and more evidence about that tool. So again, it's important to note that it's not an economy, it's a continuum. And our goal is to continue to find ways to further validate that tool in the populations of, of the target study target population of interest. Related to that, I also want to make sure is clear is that the fact is validity is, everyone talks about validity, is it valid or not, or is there validity evidence, but validity actually is a large umbrella term for a lot of different types of validity that underlie it. Um, some of the key sort of different types of validity, you'll see reference in the FDA as well as many other organizational stands there. There's things like content validity, are we capturing the attributes that are relevant, criterion validity, how does a measure relate to some type of gold standard if that one exists? Um, and construct validity. Um, to what extent does this measure behave in a way that you expect it to behave, whether it's cross-sectionally or longitudinally? And even within those sort of gross, uh, those subtypes of validity like construct validity, there are even subtypes within there. So the point being is, is again, you know, you have to recognize that there's all these different types of ways of looking at validity and relying on a particular measure and assessing one part of validity like content validity does not answer all the aspects of validity of a particular measure. So all those things need to be considered. Related to that, of course, then, is that it's unreasonable to expect any single measure. No single study is ever going to just suddenly validate a tool. Um, uh, it actually requires multiple studies and sometimes it need to be longitudinal studies. And so again, if you think to my original notion here is that we're building a body of evidence about how this tool behaves in a range of different settings that you would see in the world, world type of settings. And so the more studies you can do, the more you can help build that body of evidence about the validity and reliability of a particular measure. Now, as we think about the world world setting, that opens up a lot of different opportunities that maybe we didn't have when we were running our clinical trial. And as we know, in the clinical trial, you had to sort of strict sort of guidelines and principles about the tool. And maybe your population was, was much more homogeneous than what you would see in a real world type of setting. So here are a few things I've thought about in terms of thinking about, again, the, uh, the acceptance of a tool and appropriate use of a tool in a real world setting. Importantly, number one is that we work oftentimes with a much more diverse population, much more heterogeneous population than we saw in a clinical trial. This population could have more comorbidities. It could have a much more uh, diversity and race ethnicity. Um, it could have a lot more population that have low literacy rates um, as well. And so again, all these contexts that may have been excluded or not included in clinical trial are certainly relevant in clinical practice. So we need to take that in consideration and again, collect more data in that population. The second aspect that makes clinical trials, um, potentially, I'm sorry, real world settings different is the context of use. So we are using these tools in the clinical care setting. And so we need to make sure that this measure is not just used as a research tool, but has implications for improving clinical care in clinical practice, and that means we need to make sure that the measure is, is relevant and seen as useful for both clinicians and patients. Number three, we will see oftentimes in a real world setting that we're collecting much more data than we did in clinical trial. This could include more clinical data, more laboratory data and biomarkers, more patient reported data. Uh, we might collect data on healthcare utilization expenditures, and again, this provides additional information about how well our measure performs related to these different sources of information. 
The fourth issue is the mode of assessment. So we might have only used web-based platforms in a uh, trial, but in the real world setting, we might be collecting data uh, from patients at home. We might be collecting data over the phone. We might be collecting data in clinic um, or, or remotely, especially remotely in, in, under COVID-19. So we need to make sure that the tool we use can be used across these different mode of administrations and validated in there. Um, so with all these different approaches, um, we need to make sure that we are using additional tools and both qualitative and quantitative methods to validate these tools. And then again, finally thinking about real world settings, we need to make sure that the scores and data that emerges, the, that emerges from these tools is useful, not just for research, but clinical practice. Um, for assessing a patient's health status and how they change over time. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, Bryce, thanks very much for, for those comments. I appreciate it. Definitely uh, some topics for us to come back to here. Uh, next is uh, Vince Willie, who's principal scientist at Health Corps. Vince? Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, it's a uh, exciting time to be able to harness uh, the uh, the data that we now have, Mark, that you mentioned in your opening remarks, that we have an electronic format uh, much more readily now and much more ubiquitous uh, than we had at any time in the past. So certainly uh, folks are familiar with using claims data uh, for starting to do some of these evaluations. Electronic health records are, uh, are another area that is now uh, becoming much more available. And then finally, uh, Linda touched on it a little bit, uh, patient-generated data from digital health technologies uh, are, are certainly an area where I think in the future will be available for us as, as secondary data. I'm going to focus my, uh, most of my discussion around claims and, and, and medical records because at least that's what uh, you know, I've seen and, and I've seen what others have done uh, in this area. So many times folks, uh, because they've been around for the longest, have used claims data uh, to be able to develop some of these algorithms uh, for, for various endpoints. And, and one of the ways that these, these claims uh, uh, data algorithms can be validated is through medical records and linking of the two and using the, the medical records, if, if you will, as a gold standard. And, and what I've always tried to tell folks is that um, there are pros and cons with any data source. And, and certainly with claims data, um, one has to understand, as I'm sure those who are listening uh, do also well, is that what's their purpose? And their purpose is to uh, facilitate the payment of, of claims to providers. Uh, so understanding what is required for those, uh, for, those good, for those data and then what is not will help us to develop those algorithms. So you know, things like miscoding and, and rule outs uh, of diagnosis codes are, are an issue we have to deal with. Uh, the fact that for many outpatient claims, while you certainly have to have a diagnosis, the, the, the payment for that, di for that claim isn't dependent on the diagnosis specifically, only that it's there. So have to take that into account when you're developing a, an algorithm in claims. On the, on the flip side in medical records, you know, one, of the, uh, one of the cons for medical records is, is typically once you go outside of that setting, where, whether it be a particular provider's office or a health system, uh, many times, even though there's been great uh, amounts of efforts to try to have interoperability, there's still many times missing data there. So, and that's one of the, the pros of claims data is you may have a, a little greater capture for a patient as they move to various uh, care settings. So uh, there's pros and cons with each. And certainly uh, to me a Nirvana would be when we, when we try to combine both together and get the most, best strengths, but that's still at scale is probably not there just yet. So when we look at uh, claims algorithms, you know, we certainly uh, uh, see a lot of development uh, and looking at things like performance characteristics. So that it's sensitivity and specificity in PPV, for instance, against a gold standard, like I said many times is a uh, is medical record abstraction, but it could also be tying it into a, a registry if you have that ability or to an existing clinical trial or a pragmatic clinical trial that's going on. Um, so those types of things. And, and it can be as simple as you know, developing uh, code lists uh, for various either diagnoses, procedures, or, or medications. Um, and also you know, things that could be identified a priori or using machine learning techniques that, that use sophisticated you know, data science type uh, algorithms and technologies to, techniques to, uh, to go ahead and, and to determine what maybe the best way uh, to identify a certain outcome of, of interest is. 
And when we, we go to validate those uh, types of uh, endpoints, it's not only, you know, certainly having a gold standard too, but I think it's also critical as this field develops to have these uh, validations occur in different settings, uh, not only uh, for different populations, but also for different uh, systems. I think one uh, last point I think is important is that uh, absolute and relative differences. What are you trying to really uh, determine? And I think it's really important um, that when we look at uh, de the development of an algorithm, that if there is one of our particular arms of our study may have different coding differences uh, and, and maybe more likely or less likely to code something different, that's something that needs to be taken into account right from the beginning. And then last but not least, I'd say is if we can develop uh, and embed these types of algorithms, uh, development and validation into studies that are ongoing or when we plan to do them, I think we can really spring this, uh, this, uh, this uh, field forward. So thank you very much and I look forward to uh, having any questions at the end, Mark. And thanks very much for your comments as, as, as well. And next, we're going to turn to Jennifer Goldsack, who's Executive Director at Digital Medicine Society. Uh, Jennifer? Thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. And it's uh, tough to go at the end of this, but my focus will be um, specifically on patient-generated health data um, from sensor technologies as we think about the development of these measures um, in, in the real world. And it's interesting from my vantage point at Dime, I talk to a lot of folks every day who, um, if I wanted to be very unfair, I would say misuse the term real world data. Oftentimes that is, you know, a reflection for uh, anything that's happening outside of the clinic. And I think that, you know, this is a, this is a blurry distinction for folks who perhaps don't have um, a sort of history in, in traditional sort of uh, medical product development. And, you know, it is a distinction that I actually think is really blurred. First of all, if we think about sort of the development pathway, um, my colleagues have mentioned today, we've done it in Dimes playbook on digital clinical measures. You know, we ought to be looking for broad applicability across different contexts of use, whether that's in um, clinical research, whether that's in patient care, whether it's in public health. Um, and what we recommend there in the playbook sort of mirrors um, exactly what even the center's sort of best practice comes up with. We always start with the patient. We think about what are the meaningful aspects of health. We move through to concept. We then think about, you know, what's the right outcome that we want to measure? And then in turn, what's the end point? And regardless of setting, the evaluation process is the same, right? First of all, we think about the measure and is it fit for purpose? And Bryce had some lovely comments on this. Um, I also wholeheartedly agree that, you know, asking is it valid um, is not the right question in the era of sort of technology and specifically with these sensor technologies. Um, we have to think about verifying the performance of the underlying sensor. We have to think about the analytical validation um, of the algorithms we use to process that data into um, interpretable clinical information. And then we have to think about the clinical validation, which is something all of us are very comfortable with and have done for decades now um, of that measure. We also need to think about elements of the technology that have absolutely nothing to do with the measure, right? Once we've determined that the sensor output is acceptable, you know, what about the security of the information captured and transmitted um, by that um, chosen technology? How do we think about the data rights associated with how that um, data is owned, accessed, shared, and governed? How do we think about the usability and utility, not just of the tool itself, but of the data? If the data comes in in such a way that um, researchers can't possibly use it, that it can't be accommodated into EHRs, what value is it? Um, and of course, we can think that we need to think about cost as well. Um, we could probably get the perfect technology, um, but you know, at, at, at a price we can afford is key. And increasingly, as we move forward and, and there's broader use of these technologies, we need to think about operationalizing these tools. We need to think about where they fit into the broader technical ecosystem. And, and I, I am of the opinion that thinking about each endpoint, each me digital measure, each technology in isolation is not going to be the pathway for success. We need to think holistically. We need to think at this tech ecosystem level. So, you know, to me, that's what's the same and, and, and what's different. And I uh, scribbled some notes down sort of before our conversation and was 
you know, to me, not that much, right? We still need to think about the fact that, you know, whether it's, you know, prospectively in a clinical trial where we've developed and integrated one of these measures, or if we're drawing patient generated health data from a, uh, from a sensor out from real world data, that data capture is still happening in an, unsuper in an unsupervised way. So we still need to make sure that there are, you know, there's good training that exists. There's a battle over standards, right? This is not, um, you know, uh, if we go back to sort of Betamax or VHS, the standards challenge is much broader. We need metadata to interpret this information. There are critically important considerations around equity and access that transcend context of use. All of these things need to be in place for us to think about scaling these measures, regardless of context of use, whether um, sort of in an isolated circumstance, ask, uh, answering a clinical question during medical product development or out in the real world. And we need to make absolutely sure that we don't go down a road where we are developing a Pfizer measure of heart rate, a Takeda one, a DCRI measure, a Mayo Clinic measure, a CDC measure, that won't work. And having these unified visions, having the kind of conversation we're having today is critically important. Great. Th uh, thanks very much, Jennifer, and uh, also for laying out some of the challenges there at the end. And we're going to turn to a bit of discussion now. I just would uh, like to tell, I guess I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but the chat function is open. Um, if you uh, if if you all who are joining us today have any uh, questions or, or comments you'd like to add and get some uh, get some lively discussion going that way too, uh, but we just heard about both uh, the opportunities for um, better capturing the patient experience. Uh, Linda started out by the, the goal here is really getting to patient centeredness and the evidence that we develop, um, but also as uh, as, as Jennifer uh, just reprised, uh, a lot of dimensions and, and ways in which um, uh, validation could be challenging. Maybe just to start, if you all could briefly describe anyone who wants to take this, since we've heard about examples from clinical outcome assessments, digital measurements, um, EMR, uh, and secondary algorithms, and so forth, um, any success story that you'd like to mention briefly where, you know, there's been a, uh, an unaddressed need or, or a potential for using um, the real world evidence approach to generating um, the, uh, the, the patient, um, to generating the endpoint measure, and there's actually been some success. Um, any uh, uh, positive stories that you all would like to share briefly? Hey, Mark, this is this is Vince. Um, uh -huh. Yes, you know, certainly, uh, again, since it's been around uh, for, for a while, been used so long, claims data, obviously, there's been multiple um, opportunities to do it for observational type studies. And, and you think about uh, endeavors such as uh, FDA uh, Sentinel looking at safety signals, and, and they've they've published lots of validations. Yeah. I can tell you in some of the studies that we're doing right now, uh, we're combining uh, we're looking at not only endpoints that are collected uh, from patient sites in our pragmatic clinical trials, but we're also collecting that data via claims and are gonna do analyses that look uh, at, at validating those algorithm claims and see if the results would have changed using one uh, kind of mode of data versus the other. Mm -hmm. Um, on the sensor side, I think we're seeing some tremendous results come out from our colleagues at, uh, at Scripps, particularly around um, uh, conditions like flu, which have obviously been uh, of, of great interest given their sort of similarity to COVID, um, but also what I would describe as sort of public health issues, right, from things like um, uh, chronic hypertension, diabetes, we're starting to see sort of a coalescence um, around some of these digital measures, which I think is a strong signal. We're starting to see that too coming out um, in some mobility data from our colleagues at Evidation Health. Um, they've done some terrific work in pre and post surgical populations, starting to look at these measures out in the wild. Um, and similarly, with a variety of new, uh, neurological conditions, um, colleagues at Sage Bio Networks have done some great work. There is, 
an increasing body of literature, one thing I would caution us on is going back to this idea that we don't want these um, sort of disparate measures emerging. And I think that's really important. And mm. I'm always scared to talk about standards because it feels so overwhelming. Um, very quickly, Mark, um, at Dime, we maintain a crowdsource library of, of digital endpoints. And when we started a year ago, we had 38, we now have 155. And someone said to me the other day, mm. tremendous, maybe next year you'll have 2000. I thought, I hope not. <laughs> because there aren't 2000 interesting things to measure digitally. So I think that's the next piece now. We're starting to see these signals. How do we pool that information, those success stories? Get, getting those grouped. And it sounds like that's a great way to get at, Jennifer, the issue you raised earlier, just making sure that these digital measures do reflect what they're actually intended to, uh, to reflect. Great to hear that coming together. Um, we got a, one um, comment in the chat uh, uh, already. I'm not sure we're going to be able to get to, to all of these, but uh, it's talking about the use of uh, six minute walk test, um, how that may not be part of routine evaluation, but maybe it's uh, 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 part of um, uh, part of uh, uh, an endpoint that can be useful in this context. Um, this may be a question uh, more for Linda, but you talked about, um, uh, and, and Kara in her opening comments talked about about uh, patient reported outcomes, patient reported functional, functional um, measures. Um, those seem very important for, for patient centeredness. And I'm not sure if six minute walk test is a, is a best example of that, but do you have any, uh, uh, any favorites that you'd like to talk about that maybe show the way for using these approaches to, uh, uh, for real world evidence to get at an important um, aspect of patient function or, or well being? Yeah, I have two examples I can bring up. One is the patient reported outcome version of the um, cancer trial adverse event. And, you know, that's used heavily in clinical trials now to understand patient experience of tolerability. It's also being very heavily used in clinic settings. And there are publications that demonstrate that monitoring tolerability using the pro CTCAE can impact outcomes and improve outcomes for patients with cancer. So it's the same idea, the same measure fits both settings, but it's bringing great value on both sides. Um, I think the other is a measure like the asthma control test, which is measuring, used in clinical trials, measuring asthma control, which is also an incredibly important concept in asthma care. And we know that that's often used in pragmatic trials and other effectiveness studies to monitor population health with respect to asthma. So those are the two examples that I can come up with very quickly. Great. Uh, thank, thanks for those. And Martha um, Sabrina. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just want to add on to uh, Linda's wonderful comments and, and respond back to your good question there because you had brought up the six minute walk test. And, you know, it, and, you know, it, it's it, it, as a performance based measure, it, it's used a lot in clinical trials. And, and the patient, as we all know, is in the unobstructed space where they're walking up and down the hall for six minutes. But the important thing is that is we find that measures a very specific aspect of mobility. But the question is, is that a patient-centered outcome? We don't talk, you don't hear patients say, you know, no, I'm, you know, for me, a good quality of life is being able to walk, you know, in six minutes <laughs> on a straight path there. But most importantly, what patient-ported outcomes can do is look at overall how their disease or treatments impact in their lives. So we can, importantly, from the patient perspective, is not their grip strength or six minute or up and down thing there is how their ability to be able to work, to go to school, to um, be able to do both basic activity of daily living, but instrumental activity of daily living. And so when you see measures like the PROMISE system there, it's able to provide a much more holistic global assessment of how that patient's functioning is doing. I've done a lot of evaluation. I've looked at a lot of studies. Um, we find the correlation between these performance-based tests and PRO measures they all range about 0.4 to 0.6. And so they're related, they measure different unique concepts. Again, the performance based tests are very narrow, whereas the PRO is a much more global perspective. And I think, again, in real world, patients sort of like the more real world, how my life is impacted than their ability to get up and down or to walk for six minutes. For six minutes. That's great. And that, that actually leads to the next topic that I want to bring up is to follow up on a few of your comments about um, validation. And there are some cases you all mentioned where there is maybe a, a gold standard available, or at least a commonly accepted uh, approach to work against. It's got a, um, a chat comment from Bruce Garrett, who talks about a, um, 
10,000 patient real world study uh, that he was involved in conducting involving oral anticoagulants uh, versus warfarin in patients with atrial fibrillation that had endpoints of stroke, GI bleed, all cause mortality, where they could reproduce the results of a much larger meta-analysis of previous clinical trials. So that's kind of a, uh, an external standard um, uh, is available. But I think many of you all highlighted the challenges when there isn't necessarily a, a well-established uh, standard available for comparison. Um, any further guidance about what to do in that circumstance um, where, where you're developing a measure that doesn't have a, um, a direct, uh, well-validated or gold standard analog but still may be really useful for understanding the uh, patient-centered uh, experience approach to evidence? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, but I also, I lean to my other colleagues as well, is I actually work in a lot of areas where we don't have a gold standard. I, a lot of my research is focused on symptoms and functioning. And so uh, things like anxiety, depression, uh, fatigue, uh, sleep disturbance, I know, and a lot of these things really there's not that we lack a gold standard. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, what we're, but that doesn't mean that we can't validate those particular tools. As I noted, there's a lot of different ways we can look at the validity and reliability of a measure in absence of a gold standard. And so, you know, for example, um, you know, uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, like fatigue, um, you know, is, uh, you know, we can take our new measure of fatigue if oh, there's lots of good fatigue measures out there, but if I had like new Bryce's fatigue measure there, um, there are different ways I can look at it both internally, but externally. And so I can compare it externally to, um, to another existing fatigue measure and I expect them to be correlated together. I could uh, look at uh, what's called um, responsiveness over time. And so I know that in cancer, if I give patients chemotherapy, they should have more fatigue than they were before. So again, there are a lot of different approaches, both qualitatively and quantitatively that we can look to provide validation information or evidence in absence of a gold standard. Uh, other thoughts? Thanks, Bryce. Um, Bryce, I couldn't agree more. And I think on the, you described the qualitative side really nicely, actually, I would riff off what it means to do the quantitative piece there. And I think that the way we'll have the fastest gains is, you know, some kind of data pooling um, and benchmarking activities, right? To have these data sets to start over time, demonstrating that we're seeing reproducible signals in the data that do indeed jive with what the patient tells us they're experiencing, and that it is indeed important that mm -hmm. this signal can differentiate between patients who are doing well or not doing well, who are responding to a therapy or not responding to a therapy, whose disease is progress progressing or whose disease is not, right? And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges, particularly on sort of the sensor side, which is all of this data frustratingly lives in silos. There's no reason for it to do so. It's not in a manila folder anymore, but we still haven't quite hit that inflection point where we're willing to create community normative data sets where we're able to pull this kind of information to do this benchmarking. And I think that's really important. Well, I, I see a good bit of head nodding with your comments, Jennifer, and uh, it seems like some of the work that you're um, doing as part of your digital medicine efforts are to, to try to bring those uh, different data and, and uh, measures together. Um, and this gets this, this is actually a great transition to our next panel, which is about the policy side of things. So now we've talked about some of the opportunities and um, promise and challenges around validation um, of uh, real world endpoints. Um, let's now switch gears to talk about what to do to increase their um, uh, impact. And that includes, uh, I think uh, very much uh, addressing issues of encouraging data pooling and uh, moving appropriately to more standardized approaches. So. Uh, before we do that, I want to thank all of our panelists for a, a, a great discussion of some of the uh, important opportunities and examples now of how uh, real-world endpoints are being used uh, and some of the challenges ahead and how to overcome them. Uh, and so that's, a, again, a great transition into the policy implications for advancing the acceptability of real-world endpoints. In this session, we're going to uh, cover the challenges surrounding real-world endpoint development and the opportunities to improve the regulatory 
acceptability of real world endpoints. And in addition, the panelists will have some comments on how the stakeholder community can work together to develop outcomes that are meaningful, including that are validated for a range of stakeholders purposes, including patients, researchers, and regulators. Uh, for this uh, uh, third uh, session, we have three panelists, uh, uh, Belinda king Kalaman, Kalamanis uh, from Longevity, uh, Eric Klein from Eli Lilly, and Elizabeth Orlein from the National Health Council. And to start things off, I'm going to turn to Belinda first. She's the Director of Patient Focused Research at uh, Longevity. Belinda? Hi, thanks, Mark, and thank you for having me on this panel today. Um, before I start, as Mark said, I'm currently at Longevity, uh, which is a patient advocacy foundation, but I do have a former regulator hat, um, so uh, my comments may sort of oscillate between the two. Um, so I think that the challenge with getting folks to accept real-world endpoints across stakeholder groups centers around language. And we really do need to be using the same terms where it's applicable. And the white paper that uh, Duke Margolis has put out sort of is trying to push that. And I think that's really important. Um, also referenced in that report is the SMN framework, which the International Council for Harmonization published last year. And I really think this framework can help improve the acceptability of real world endpoints to all stakeholders. Um, and the reason I think that is because that when the study objective is laid out using this particular framework, I think it makes it really transparent to all the stakeholders, the who, the what, and the why of um, the endpoint that's being developed. So for example, while it might seem fairly straightforward to describe the target population, I have seen protocols, even for randomized clinical trials, where it isn't clear who will be included in the analysis particularly in the presence of confounding events like disease progression or the use of re uh, rescue medications. So when this information is laid out using the SMN framework, which calls to um, uh, sponsors or study investigators to do this, it's easy for all regula for regulators and other stakeholders, even including, for example, the biostats team who ultimately analyze the data, to sort of see the strengths and limitations and generalizations associated with a particular endpoint. And this is true, like many folks have sort of mentioned, it doesn't really matter what the data source is, whether it's being generated by a trial or from the real world. Moving over a little bit, I think there are some areas that are going to be easier for real world data to get a hold over than others. So for example, and Linda sort of started to mention this in the discussion, um, Tracking and monitoring of symptoms while patients are on treatment is starting to show some real traction. And she sort of uh, touched on uh, Dr. Ethan Bash's study where he has rolled out patient reported symptom, a symptom monitoring system for patients receiving cancer care. And Dr. Bash and his colleagues just published a study where they expanded this system out to 50 clinical sites. And they concluded that there was both clinical utility and value in this effort. And I think if this can be become part of routine care, it really aligns nicely with um, the pilot initiative that the FDA Oncology Center of Excellence launched over the summer. This initiative is called Project Patient Voice, and it's a public-facing website, and it's currently in the pilot phase, as I mentioned, and has data from one trial, and it presents the patient-reported symptoms that were collected by that sponsor, um, and they collected that data weekly over the, about the first five cycles of treatment in different formats. And I think that this information adds a lot of value because at the moment, what we see reported in the prescribing information when it comes to symptomatic adverse events is really limited. And part of that's just to do with the format of that label. But I think patient reported, let's say nausea when collected on a regular interval can provide really complementary information that goes beyond that incidence that would be reported for nausea in the label. And it can allow us to look at say the worsening of that symptom and provides information on whether, say, nausea occurs earlier or later in treatment. And it is starting to be collected more routinely in randomized clinical trials. It takes some time to get some traction there, I think. But as we start to see it get collected in clinical trials and simultaneously clinical practice, 
what we're looking to do at Longevity is create a real world patient voice to build on that work that the FDA is doing. And while we are aware that, as I said, it's in the beginning stages of having that data accessible and from clinical practice, I think it would be really nice to have a trial version and a real world version to help close that efficacy effectiveness gap that we see. Um, and I do think one of the other challenges we have with real world data is we can't let ourselves think that it is a fix for serving underserved patients because they're in the real world. I do think that if you are asking people to opt into systems, that it'll, there will be some self-selection bias and we need to really work to build the trust um, of the community and patients that we're working with to ensure that we are actually getting information on underserved folks. So these are just a few thoughts I have on advancing acceptability of real world endpoints and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Great. Uh, Belinda, thank you very much. I appreciate um, your giving a very concrete example around uh, uh, patient reported symptoms during treatment and how a combination of um, action by researchers to develop a research base, uh, stakeholder support, and uh, FDA action, you mentioned the OCE uh, pilot, um, we're working together to move forward progress in this area. Um, next, we're gonna turn to Eric Klein, who's Senior Director of Oncology in the Global Patient Outcomes and Real World Evidence Department at Eli Lilly. Thanks, Mark. And um, thank you to uh, Kara and the entire Duke Margolis team for putting the session together. Um, my comments this morning and this afternoon are gonna focus on stakeholder engagement. So as I've listened to the discussion, a lot of this has resonated with me. There's um, certainly a formidable task in develop, developing and implementing endpoints. Um, lots of challenges associated with that. The differences in the value placed on various stakeholders or placed on those endpoints by various stakeholders is really, really substantial. Um, the acceptability of how the endpoint is measured is another. The use case is another example of challenges. Um, but while all these challenges and complex complexities exist, if you look across the stakeholders, I think it's heartening to know we do have a commonality. So whether it's regulators, payers, clinicians, patients, other policymakers, but extending that to caregivers, drug and other technology developers, um, the thing that is common for everyone is the goal to improve healthcare and control costs in an appropriate manner. So successfully achieving these goals requires a pretty substantial effort to collaborate with, engage with, and seek input from those stakeholders um, across the decision-making ecosystem, as I'll call it. So to that end, I thought I would offer some observations and comments on um, some of the challenges that exist with uh, engaging the stakeholders, but also finding common ground. Um, you know, I recall a paper um, that I know Sean Tunis was one of the authors on uh, that was published back in Health Affairs. I think it was in 2010, but these same sort of principles kind of form um, and resonate with my thoughts about stakeholder engagement today. So there's five things we tend to think about when we think about engaging the various stakeholders and getting perspective. One is um, this idea of balanced representation. Um, pretty common sense that you're going to want to get as many people at the table as you can, but that in and of itself is um, not the, the extended depth of the complexity there. So we're obviously interested in understanding is there common ground on endpoints, but beyond is there common ground on endpoints, is there common ground on the measurement of those endpoints, the collection of the endpoints, the analyst analysis of the endpoints. And for us as a technology developer, the rubber kind of meets the road when we meet with the review divisions or those that support the review divisions at the regulatory agency, such as the Real World Evidence Working Group. And so we might be able to have um, stakeholder discussions that include regulators in academic settings, but those generally do not represent the full agreed upon policy discussion between the developer and the agency. And so we oftentimes still have to triangulate our phase two, phase three discussions with what we hear publicly um, in public forums from the agency. So that's one challenge, but balance representation is the first, I think. The second is to make sure that all the stakeholders really understand their roles. And so 
Um, you can see this often with patients and caregivers where, you know, you want to make sure they understand we don't look to them to tell us how to do the research. We ask them to understand what's meaningful to them and then what's the extension of the issues that they find meaningful. Is it a functioning endpoint? But what does that functioning mean back to the whole issue of uh, mobility and is it a six minute walk test or is it really more something that's um, relevant to their day to day life in a more extended fashion. I think the th third point that's important in stakeholder engagement is to have really expert facilitation of that discussion and I don't just mean expert in the topic, although that is important, but true expert in the um, what I'll call art and science of facilitation, and I think there's some good examples of that. Um, that while good also have some challenges. Um, I think the Critical Path Institute is one good example. The collaboration that's existed there has produced qualified instruments, to my knowledge, I think in five places. I think there's qualified instrument, instruments in non-small cell lung cancer now around the symptom assessment questionnaire around CHF, I think in major depressive disorder, asthma, COPD. And so I think that's a good example of coordinated stakeholder engagement. Um, at the same time, I think our experience there is it's really, really slow and we can all collectively do a better job at getting faster at that engagement. In my space in oncology, I think the Friends of Cancer Research do a nice job at getting multi-stakeholder engagement on topics that can move policy issues forward. The fourth point is really connection among the stakeholders. So connecting the insights that come from all those different perspectives and are those insights the same? What are the unknowns? We often find that the actual questions of interest to people tend to, on the surface, be quite different. But if you probe deeply into the concepts and the issues, they, are, they have more similarity than we oftentimes might think. And then the last piece is kind of this idea of perpetual or persistent engagement. So this is important because that enables the sort of iterative learning that takes place and the dialogue that allows us to embrace what might be possible that we hadn't thought before. I think this has come up earlier in the discussion with things like digital technologies that enable better sampling, more real-time data collection. Um, there's obviously a huge future in biometrics, um, data that's collected in the usual course of care in my space, in oncology. Lots of interest in the use of radiographic images to assess tumor progression in the real world. So I think those are really some key important steps and what, we, what I kind of list as a group of five to consider when we uh, think about stakeholder engagement. So I think I'll pause my comments there and look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Great, uh, Eric, thanks for that, uh, that overview of uh, all these key dimensions of stakeholder engagement, very useful for advancing this work. Um, next uh, perspective we'll go to is from Elizabeth Erlein, who's Senior Director for Research and Programs at the National Health Council. Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Great, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Duke Margolis, for inviting me. Um, I wanted to start off by just providing a little bit of background about the work that we're doing in real world evidence, which is focused specifically on patient engagement in real world evidence. Um, and then I can talk a little bit about how we think about that um, in terms of outcomes that can be uh, translated into endpoints for measurement in uh, real world evidence. Um, so the focus of our work has been in terms of blending FDA's patient focused drug development program with FDA's real world evidence initiative. And so the first work stream has really been in terms of capacity building among the patient community to be sure that um, when we go to the patient community to talk about real world evidence and real world data, um, that there's the awareness and um, an ability to participate meaningfully in those conversations. We're really excited to be working with Duke Margolis in those efforts. Um, and then our other initiative in real world evidence has been about um, if you engage patients and um, find out what's important to them, how do you actually take what patients tell you is important to them and what their experience have been and translate that into real world studies that better reflect the experiences of patients or the subjects whose experiences make up real world data. Um, so we'll be re releasing some guiding practices about that in early 2021. Um, but I think that this is a really important conversation. Uh, over the past decade or so, we've been citing real world evidence and the advantages of real world evidence over traditional um, study designs is, you know, one of the primary advantages is the ability to study outcomes and other things that are important to patients and other stakeholders. 
Um, so as we um, continue to proliferate and use real world evidence and decision making, it's really important that we put in the effort to figure out what it is that patients are interested in having better evidence about and then measure those things. Um, so sometimes it might be the, the very same things that clinicians are interested in. Sometimes it might be the same things that value assessors are interested in others, um, but sometimes it's not. Um, so I wanted to amplify two points um, that I heard earlier. Um, one was, as Eric mentioned, with regards to identifying stakeholder roles. Um, it's also important to note that real world data researchers don't have to be the ones to engage patients directly. Um, there's already a tremendous amount of work out there that the patient community is doing, that FDA has done in the past, and that other researchers are doing. Um, so there's all kinds of qualitative studies that can be found, voice of the patient reports. Um, on FDA's website, external voice of the patient's reports, and so on and so forth, um, that can be used as a starting point when identifying what are outcomes that matter to patients. Um, and then I also wanted to um, reiterate Linda's comment that she made in her opening remarks um, when she mentioned core outcome sets as an opportunity for us to harmonize across stakeholders to ensure that we're prioritizing measurement of the outcomes that matter the most to patients, but then also other stakeholders as well. Um, and so again, building off of an existing initiative at FDA, the, the core sets of clinical outcome assessments, but then thinking about it much more broadly, um, first in terms of just general core outcome sets. But from our experience, what we find is that um, in many instances, what patients tell us is important to them um, aren't just limited to health outcomes, but also include things like financial or caregiver related burdens, um, which wouldn't really very neatly fall under the health outcome um, header. And so how can we think about maybe core impact sets or um, other harmonized ways of, of thinking about a particular therapeutic area? Um, so those were my couple of opening remarks. I'm excited for the Q&A. Yeah, me too. Thanks, thanks Elizabeth and all of you. Uh, some, some great uh, comments to get us thinking for this session on uh, uh, policies to help advance um, uh, this whole field on uh, um, uh, on real world endpoints, and maybe we could start with uh, what's been the huge policy issue for the year, which is uh, COVID nineteen response. Um, any comments that you'd care to make about either in the area of COVID um, uh, therapy development, or more generally in the work that you've been doing? Uh, how has COVID changed things? I mean, we've seen in many aspects of healthcare, it's made us uh, uh, or helped us find out we can do some things we thought we couldn't do in terms of uh, remote monitoring and, and delivering care in new ways, uh, conducting research uh, in uh, clinical trial research in, in new ways. Not clear how much of that's going to stick. It's not clear um, uh, what all the downsides have been either, but certainly some big reforms. Any um, uh, points that are particularly applicable to uh, real world endpoint development? Hey, Mark, I'll comment real quickly um, back to the stakeholder issue. I think one of the big sort of learnings that I see is just in general, the sort of um, urgency that this public health crisis has created and the fact that, you know, we've seen science and um, organizations do so much so quickly. So back to this idea of endpoint measurement, I know, you know, we oftentimes are beholden to the planes, trains, and automobiles to get us together to have these discussions. And, um, you know, while I'd love to be in person, face to face with people more like most of you would be, this technology is actually quite efficient and quite doable to gather stakeholders together and not have to wait for when people can get on a plane, when we can get them in the same building, when we can have that discussion. The content of discussion can be, I think, facilitated really, 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 really well with this technology. And if we can take the urgency that we felt with a public health crisis like COVID to the same urgency of endpoint measurement and alignment on that goal of improving health uh, with controllable costs, I think that's one of the takeaways for me. Any other, other comments, uh, uh, COVID experience? <laughs> well, it's all encompassing. Um, but I, I mean, I think to Eric's point, it does show that when we want to, we can, um, we can make changes rapidly. And so when we're talking about things like core outcome sets, core impact sets, um, Sylvia's joined us, um, that we, um, that, you know, we can, we can think about these, 
large um, efforts and think about um, pushing them forward. And to the point about the virtual engagement really being um, being, being um, much easier nowadays is also when we think about core outcome sets and thinking about international engagement or thinking about um, diversity and inclusion across the United States, it's really um, a potential facilitator. Yeah, now you all have, have maybe emphasized the um, path of core outcome sets with um, broad or representative participation being a, a pathway for, for um, greater use and have also highlighted the role of FDA working with stakeholders to support pre-competitive collaborations around um, endpoint development and validation to, to accelerate this, um, uh, this process. Um, any further thoughts about ways in which uh, pre-competitive collaborations for endpoint um, validation and development could be accelerated. I know you've given some good examples already, but maybe putting the policy hat on, any recommendations for what FDA could do to support these efforts or what we can uh, collectively do, perhaps in collaboration with regulators to um, accelerate the pre-competitive collaborations. Um, I think there's one thing that's been interesting in the oncology space, and that has been the CISAQOL effort. And that's um, a group in Europe through the EORTC, which is like a cooperative group, have brought together stakeholders, um, regulators, Health Canada, EMA, Europe, payers, academics, industry, to create um, work packages that tackle some of the issues that people are facing within oncology. And I think because they've um, made such a wide collaboration of folks that, you know, recently I was on another working group that was going to cross over with CISACOL potentially, and we were able to have a discussion and talk about like, oh, well, this is actually crossing over with another effort. We should talk to that group and see how we help each other and pull resources. And that's in that pre-competitive space. And I think if groups come together like this and make sure that their reach is wide, we don't get siloed and we all know, you know, there's somebody who's going to double up somewhere and potentially call that out and allow people to collaborate then and pull resources. I think one other point um, that is sort of builds off of how we, how we got here with patient-focused drug development, where it's become kind of a norm is um, with the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, um, number five, back in, in 2012 when it was implemented. And um, at first, FDA was hosting um, patients and they were doing their own FDA-led patient-focused drug development meetings. And then they established a process for externally-led meetings. And so uh, many folks from across um, the patient community and across the research community took those instructions for the externally led meetings and then went with them and have put out reports. And so I think trying to leverage the, the reauthorization conversations um, as part of proliferation of core outcome sets um, as an example, and then really trying to um, figure out what's that mechanism by which other folks can pick it up and, and go with it. Um, I think is is another great opportunity for us uh, in terms of policy moving forward. And uh, there is another user fee reauthorization uh, uh, coming up. I guess we're up to seven now, as well as um, some bipartisan interest in um, building on the 21st century cures legislation, which included uh, uh, a lot of support for for rural world evidence development. Uh, Eric, any any thoughts from uh, uh, industry perspective on this? You know, nothing different than I think what Elizabeth and Belinda mentioned. Um, I think those hit on the several several of the same points I would have made. Okay, um, and let me um, ask uh, another follow up about uh, a theme that that all of you emphasize essentially about um, uh, representativeness and breadth of um, patient inclusion and, and perspective inclusion in these efforts. Um, we've also seen a lot of interest in 2020 for understandable reasons around um, issues related to equity. Um, have you all seen any impact of um, the, the of an increased attention around making sure um, diverse patient groups are, are well represented, including from a uh, racial and ethnic uh, minority status in efforts to develop and, uh, and validate the, uh, these um, uh, real world endpoint measures. 
So we started having some discussions with different groups um, for one of the studies we're currently running at Longevity, it's a longitudinal study to look at treatment and um, some patient outcomes. And I think at the moment, it's still early days. Um, people are reaching out to these groups that represent uh, underserved and underrepresented folks. And I think we have to be careful about our requests to those groups that they're neutral, they're, they're effort neutral, if you will, like that we don't put it all on them to help us and that we really like work to find ways to build partnerships with people that are collaborative and really give back versus just kind of taking. So I think we're still early, um, but I hope people are starting to make more of a concerted effort. Yeah, I would just add, Mark, that um, it is certainly elevated the discussion on this topic and in lots of, lots of different places where um, I guess I'll say three things. One is I've seen it clearly impact our efforts in clinical trial enrollment. Um, that's one thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've seen as well, it elevate discussions in areas of interest that we maybe wouldn't or didn't prioritize as key research questions previously. So um, one example of that is disparities in uh, NGS testing in the oncology space. We're doing some work in that space now that was prompted by some hypothesis generating work that did point out some substantial differences. Um, so that those, those are two things. Um, sorry, I lost the train of, my train of thought on the third item, but it, it might come back to me. <laughs> That's okay. Those are, those are two good ones to start with. Um, and then continuing in the path of uh, policy, implica uh, policy implications here, um, any particular regulatory pathways, programs um, that um, would be important for uh, FDA and all of us to consider modifications to uh, make it easier to move forward with this with this work. Um, you know, I'm thinking of perhaps regulatory designs that were appropriate for the clinical trial context, but maybe uh, maybe problematic uh, here. I had a couple of comments related to, for example, how um, requiring. Uh, um, um, double-blind uh, placebo-controlled studies for PRO efficacy uh, validation uh, can be difficult in the in the real-world evidence context. Uh, uh, questions like that. So I'll just comment, Mark. I, th I think there's there continues to be a lot of opportunity um, still, but a lot to learn in the space of the concept of things like real world contemporaneous control arms. Um, you know, it's very much a use case by use case scenario. We've tried, we've done some of this work and found some very good opportunity for control arms and we've done some work and we found, um, boy, those, those aren't, those don't represent good control arms at all. And so, um, but I think it's, I think it's a big opportunity. Um, and I did remember the other thing I was going to mention on the disparities real quick, which was um, that ironically, we have found it difficult at times to find um, good data in some of our data sets simply around gender or simply around race, mm -hmm. ethnicity. So better, better data collection there. Uh, yeah, I hear yeah. that, uh, hear that a lot. Um, so we're almost out of time. Just to, to wrap up, I want to ask one forward-looking question uh, in terms of accelerating progress. Um, for, um, uh, can you all maybe give me a, a, a quick example? Uh, you don't have to choose your favorite, but an area where you think um, the time is ripe for, um, uh, let's call it a use case, a, a, a more concerted effort between um, stakeholder groups, uh, regulators around uh, advancing um, uh, the use of real world, real, real world endpoints. Uh, any particular uh, use case area or, or application area that you're, you think is particularly promising right now as we head into 2021? I think it's it's a tough question. There's a lot of different um, potential potential use cases, but um, not to sound like a broken record, but I think you know <laughs> one of the things that we we'd love to see is is to to see the work that FDA's been doing on um, core sets of clinical outcome assessments be expanded, and then to think about what does that look like in the context of a real world. Um, data study design, um, how can that be translated into endpoints and 
um, you know, as we're starting to think about harmonizing how we define um, endpoints, and I, I think just reiterating the point about we don't want a dozen different versions of how we define endpoints, um, but really to start with the patient, figure out what are those outcomes that are important or the impacts, and then work work from there to to define the out the how they're being measured. Related to that, I had a comment in the chat about um, applications potentially in the area of label expansion studies, maybe on on something like um, you know side effects during treatment or or symptoms during treatment is uh, is a good area. Uh, Belinda. Yeah, I think that's that that's a great place to start. I think some of the other concepts of interest are, are challenging to do, whereas I think those ones are something that we can do right more or less right now, given some of the work that's already been done that can potentially start to touch on vulnerable populations. But as I said, you do have to get people if you're doing, even if it's um, bring your own device and you fill the PRO on your own uh, smartphone or computer or what have you, I still think you have to think about how you're going to recruit underserved folks. They're just not gonna sign up just because you want them to. I mean, I think we have to build relationships with them um, because, and earn their trust. It's not just enough to set, come and have someone say, we're doing a study, can you put this app on your phone for us? I, I don't think we're gonna get there with that kind of approach. Thanks, uh, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I continue to think that Alzheimer's disease area is a really interesting space. It's clearly a cognitive disease, but it has so many more endpoints that are relevant to caregivers and patients themselves. It continues to be a really interesting space. Yeah, Alzheimer's disease sounds good. I'll just throw out one myself. Uh, uh, we're headed for post-market evidence evaluation in all likelihood on um, uh, COVID vaccines. And the CDC has developed an app that's intended for smartphones for people to use to self-report on symptoms that they have uh, uh, shortly after vaccine use and for the longer term as well. Uh, it's going to require that same uh, set of issues, Belinda, that you described around trust, also issues around can we get to representativeness. So you know, these are this is being a very important source of uh, evidence on a timely question. Um, as you can see, the, the endpoint issues we're covering here are quite, uh, quite live and relevant today. And I want to thank all of you for uh, helping to bring this to life and, and uh, raise some very important issues as we try to uh, advance policy related to real world endpoints. Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, for the rest of our participants, uh, we are almost out of time, but I'd like to thank you as well for attending this event. Um, we will be continuing to produce uh, further out outputs uh, like uh, the, the white paper discussed today, related reports and other efforts to support the advancement of, uh, of not just real world endpoints, but the whole uh, uh, area of uh, real world data and real world evidence development. So please uh, uh, stay in touch with us and, and follow us along on the, uh, on our website. And if you're not on our mailing list, uh, please uh, uh, go to the website and, and get on it. Um, last, I'd like to give a special thanks to the team at uh, Duke Margolis, along with all of our uh, presenters today and all the people in the uh, uh, Real World Evans Consortium that helped put together the work group and other supporters that helped uh, put this together. Um, from our team, uh, special thanks to Morgan Romine, uh, uh, Patty Green, Luke Durocher, uh, Christina Silcox, uh, Joy, Eric, Joy Eckert, um, our spotlight presenter, Kara Marcone, uh, Valerie Parker, and also Mira Gill. Uh, thanks to all of them for making this possible. And again, thanks to all of you for joining us, for the comments. Uh, we look forward to continue to work with you on these very important issues. Have a, have a great rest of the day.